Hello, friends, and welcome to episode number 34 of Nostalgia Talk. I'm back. Sorry that it's been a little while, but it's been a busy last few weeks. Uh, but I'm still here. I'm James, and today on Nostalgia Talk, let's give a big welcome to Rick Lyon. Hi, Rick. Hi, James. Hi, everybody else. <laughs> How's it going? I'm good. Thanks for inviting me onto your show. I'm glad to be here to, you know, I'm always glad to talk about myself. I, you know, there, it doesn't take any encouragement at all for me to sit and yak for myself. In fact, you'll probably have a difficult time shutting me up. So. <laughs> well, let's, let, let's see if we get a lot of thumbs down on this video, then that'll probably be the uh, main. Well, I saw, I saw some of your interviews run almost two hours. So you know, yeah, yeah ex well. expect this one to go to like four or five. <laughs> well, let's let's see. Uh, now, for anyone who doesn't know who Rick Lyon is, Rick is a puppeteer who has been on lots of TV shows and movies and even on stage. He's been on Sesame Street. He's done work with the Muppets. He was on Bear in the Big Blue House, Between the Lions, Crank Yankers, Men in Black. He was uh, an original cast member on Avenue Q. Are there any projects that I'm missing? Uh, Stick Stickly. Um, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, right, uh, yes. two and three films. One of the worst films ever made in the whole history of history, <laughs> Never Ending Story 3, which we called Never Ending Misery. Oh, my God. And also Book of Pooh. I can't believe I forgot about that. That was one of my favorite shows from my childhood. And um, in addition to... And also, and I've also, um, I'm sort of... I'm sorry, my Wi-Fi is bad, so you, your audio just dropped out for me. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I, w I was just continuing the, uh, the intro. I was going to say that in addition to being a good puppeteer, Rick is also a great puppet builder as well. Designer and builder, yes. And that's the thing about Avenue Q. I wasn't just in the show. I designed and created all the puppets for the show as well. Oh, nice. So all so like Trekkie Monster and Princeton and all them? Everybody. Every, every puppet that's on stage... I designed and built. And I know that none of the uh, listeners example, can see. Here's a look at, uh, a look at Trekkie Monster. Everybody always wants to see the puppets. So here you go. Hi, Hi James. How are hey. you? I am good well. You. So the internet is good for more than just uh, questionable things. <laughs> so it's, it's also good for Zoom. Yes, very much. And nostalgia talk as well, because a lot of people are really enjoying this. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, uh, I, I gotta go. Bye bye. Good, good to have you here. <laughs> Thank you, Rick. Oh, yeah. For, and, uh, uh, for you know, that was that's the thing about Avenue Q that was so unusual about it as 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 an experience for me because I I was a designer on the show and built all the puppets and was in the show too, and that that just like you know in Broadway that just doesn't happen. You know you'll you'll never see William Ivy Long act in a show that he's you know designed this costumes for it just doesn't happen um so it was a very unique experience and and if i'd had any idea how hard wearing all those different hats for avenue q would be i probably would have said no uh if i'd known how much work it was going to be because mm. it, <laughs> it nearly killed me it was very difficult to spread myself that thin but i'm glad i did uh did you ever build any puppets for sesame street no um Generally speaking, there are a few very minor exceptions, but generally speaking, things are much more compartmentalized with the Muppet universe. Um, I mean, Jim started, you know, building and performing and everything himself, but as his empire grew and there was more need for performers and more need for building, he separated the functions. So the people who build don't generally uh, perform and the people who perform don't generally build. Now, there have been some exceptions to that. Famously, Dave Goals came on as uh, a builder originally, and uh, Jim saw in Dave uh, his performance abilities, and he eventually started, it wasn't, I guess I don't, I shouldn't say eventually, he, he started performing for them as well, and um, eventually stopped building and performed exclusively. He obviously became one of the main Muppet performers. Mm. But it's unusual. No, I never I never built anything for Sesame Street. I was a uh, performer for the Henson Company for about 16 years. Mm. 
Yeah, uh, many of you listeners, if you're big Sesame Street fans like me, you'd probably remember Rick for that role of very famously that Muppet that probably drank a coffee in Hooper's store or something, or was just reading a newspaper at Oscar's newsstand. That was probably him. No, you know, I I was a typical utility puppeteer. I did right right hands. I did cows and chickens and rocks and letters of the day or whatever, you know, whatever had to whatever had to be done. Uh, That was the thing about the old days in Sesame Street. There were so many um, there were so many Muppet things. Um, Sesame Street went through a real shift. You know, when they first started, there were only, you know, a few puppeteers. And then as the Muppet show hit and there became more and more demand for Muppet content, they brought in more and more puppeteers for the show. Um, and so eventually, you know, there were 12, 13 puppeteers working all the time on the show and, and things have paired back a little bit um, as, as the years have gone on and the show's popularity and its singularity has waned. Uh, and now that it's only a half an hour, um, they don't have as many uh, puppeteers who, who come in and out. Um, they still have big days where they'll have, you know, like they'll be doing on specials or something like that. But, you know, they don't they don't really do Muppet inserts anymore uh, now that the show is half hour format. Um, so I, I was there sort of like at a time when they were hiring lots of folks. Um, I, got, I worked a lot, uh, but, you know, very few, um, you know, principal speaking roles. You know, that's not the kind of work that I was doing for them. I did one of the things that I did that was the most unique um, is for two seasons of Elmo's World. I was one of the... Uh, uh, assistant puppeteers, I helped uh, manipulate the computer generated stuff in his room. Um, you know, the, the real time uh, CGI stuff in, in Elmo's room that all looked like his drawings, like there was a uh, computer laptop and drawers and all that sort of stuff. I did that. Um, nice. And that was me, Johnny Tartaglia, Matt Vogel and Jim Martin. We and and Kevin, it was just like the four of us uh, uh, quite often on those uh, on those Elmo World episodes uh, that we did quite a few years back now. Oh, wow. And yeah. I did, you know, and I did, like many people, I, I um, stood in for, for people, um, you know, the principal perform- performers when they had, you know, multiple characters in the same shot or, or whatever like that. One of my, one of my main functions was uh, in my early years, uh, I doubled for Carol. And so I did a bunch of Big Bird stuff. Um, again, you know, n- nothing that I was doing the dialogue for him. He would always pre-record it or lip sync it afterwards or whatever. But I did a bunch of stuff for Big Bird. Um, for years, you'd see me every day as Big Bird because I did the opening title sequences for the show for several years. Uh, I, as Big I saw Bird. that on your website. Yeah, I did that. I did that. I think the first time I did that were, was for season 20. Uh, you know, it was a big anniversary or so. You had a big blowout, you know, new opening for the show. And... I forget we did it for a while there. We were redoing the thing like every couple of years. So I did, I did like, you know, season 20 and like season 22 and like season 25, you know, I, I, I did a bunch of them. Have you ever tried doing Big Bird's voice? Oh, well, you know, everybody, everybody does Muppet impersonations, you know, in their private time or whatever, but you know, I, I never, uh, I never did it for the show. There's, there's stick stickly. I did Stick Stickly on Nickelodeon. I don't know if they, they got Nick in the afternoon up in, in Canada where you were, but uh, for years I did this little character on uh, Nickelodeon for Nick in, the after- the in, in Nick in the Afternoon. It was interstitial stuff between uh, the programs and Nick in the Afternoon and Stick Stickly, who is literally a popsicle stick, uh, was the host. And I puppeteered him and uh, made all his props and stuff for a few years. I wasn't the original Stick Stickly, but I took over after a couple of years and I did it for, for many years. So, hey, how are you doing? Uh, simmer down. Okay, bye. So, another, another goofy job that I, that I have done. So um, how did you become interested in puppetry? Like, was it Jim Henson's work? Was it like, what, what got that's, you into it? You know, that's, that's always a hard question because everybody comes to it from different things. Some people see something somewhere and they go, and that's a light bulb moment for them. I, 
I honestly, I do not remember a time when I wasn't interested in puppets. There, I have no conscious memory of a time when I wasn't interested in puppets somehow. And, and it's, you know, asking that question is, in some ways for me, is like, you know, asking somebody, well, uh, why do you like your favorite kind of music? I don't know. It's just something about it speaks to me. So I don't, I don't know how I got interested in puppetry. It's something that always interested me. Even when I was a little kid, I started making puppets when I was like eight years old or something. And uh, just out of whatever I could find. And I'm really old. All right. So the puppets that were on TV when I was a kid were uh, even like before Mr. Rogers and Sesame Street and stuff, the, the puppets that were on TV when I was a kid were Burr Tilstrom's Kukla and Ollie and the puppets on the Captain Kangaroo uh, television show, which was on TV for kids. So those are, the, those are the puppets that I was seeing on TV. And then, of course, a little bit later, I... So I was already interested in puppets. Then a little bit later, Jim's work started showing up on TV. He did a bunch of um, variety show appearances. Again, this is before Sesame Street. Um, but national uh, variety shows like the Ed Sullivan Show or the Hollywood Palace and things like that. And once I saw Jim's work, I was like, dude, that that love puppets, but anything like that. And that got me really excited. And that that style of puppetry really spoke to me and that got me really excited. So I, I've been a hobbyist, a, a puppeteer as a, you know, as a hobby ever since I was a little kid. But it wasn't until um, I was in college that I sort of started taking it more seriously. In college, I was a theater major and I was still doing puppets as a hobby. But while I was in, I was studying theater it sort of occurred to me that this this hobby that I'd been engaged in for already almost decades um, was really a very intense and complete theatrical immersion. The average puppeteer, not not TV puppeteers, mind you, but the average puppeteer who does live performances and stuff does everything. They they write their sh shows, they design and they build their puppets, they make their scenery, they build their stage, and then ultimately they also perform it. So the average puppeteer is his own sort of repertory theater company. He does everything. You know, you're the stage manager, you're the director, you're the actor, you're everything. Um, you're the producer. So while I was studying theater, I had this sort of, you know, uh, big revelation that, you know, what I'm doing here is not just a hobby. It's not something that, you know, I should consider just for fun. It's something that maybe I should think about as a career choice. And once, once I sort of had that, you know, uh, epiphany that it was something that you could do as, as a career, and it was something that you could choose to um, engage in professionally, that's when I started pursuing training. And that's when you know, all those gears started turning and my career went off in the direction of, of, of puppetry. What college did you go to? I went to Penn State, oh, which is nice. an enormous, enormous school, huge school with a very famous football program and all of that. But it's a tiny, tiny little theater department. Um, so being that the whole time I was there, you know, one of the funny things about going to college is that everybody's like the same age. And in when you're talking about theater, that means an awful lot of people are the same type. Like everybody's an ingenue, everybody's Romeo and Juliet. And there aren't a lot of character people. There aren't people who can play older characters. Well, I've always been sort of the way I am now. I've always been a tall, skinny dork. So I was easy to cast as supporting characters as character actors, you know, as characters. So I was in like every show. I was in shows all the time. And that's one of the things that made my transition to doing puppetry professionally easy because while I was at Penn State, I was I started doing um, live puppet shows in the area. And people already knew me from seeing me on stage all the time because I was in like every freaking show. And um, I would literally walk into the auditions for shows and they'd go, all right, you know, you're going to play something. Okay, whatever. Don't, you don't have to audition really. Okay. Let's hear what you got. Okay, fine. you get your cast. You know, it was, it was like 
you know, people got bored of seeing me come into the audition room because they, they knew I was going to be in the show anyway. Um, but so people had seen me on stage in the, uh, in the community had seen me on stage. Then I was starting to do puppet shows. So I kind of had a built in audience. So when I was putting myself out in the marketplace as a puppeteer, I was getting hired locally because people already knew me. I didn't have to sort of make a name for myself. So, so that was, that worked to my advantage. But while I, after I finished college and while I was staying, I stayed in the Penn state area after I was done with college. Uh, because I already had a built-in audience and I was working as a puppeteer. But uh, while I was working as a puppeteer after college, I kind of went, you know, I'm doing this thing and I'm calling myself a professional and I'm making my living as a puppeteer and I have absolutely no real training as a puppeteer. I'm completely self-taught. Um, there were no puppetry courses at Penn State or anything like that. I, I was just doing everything by the seat of my pants. I was completely self, self-taught. And I started getting fraud syndrome. And I started thinking, well, here I am earning money as a puppeteer and I have no real training. I've never even like met another human being who calls themselves a puppeteer. I, 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 I should learn more about this. How do I learn more? And it just so happened that at that time, the... Uh, Union Hill Theater, which is a, um, a theater training center up in, uh, or from your point of view, down in Connecticut, um, had a new, announced a new puppetry program. And it was brought to my attention by one of my old theater professors. And she said, I think this is something you might be interested in. And she was absolutely right. So I, I dropped everything. I totally, you know, pulled up anchor from the Penn State area and I went to Connecticut in search of um, puppetry training. And it was while I was there at the O'Neill in what was then called the Institute for Professional Puppetry Arts, a program which sadly doesn't exist anymore. That's when I made my first contact with other people who took puppetry seriously and had training in it and were interested in training other people. And that's when I made my first connection to uh, the Jim Henson organization because the, the director of IPA Bart Rockaburton had gone to school at the University of Connecticut, which is one of the only um, colleges in the U.S. that has a puppetry degree program. He went to UConn with Richard Termini, who was working at the Jim Henson workshop as a designer builder. And Bart arranged with Richard for me to get a tour of the Henson workshop. And that's when I first started making contact with that organization. I, I visited the Muppet workshop right after they'd wrapped Sesame Street. Um, the, in, the, in the old days, Sesame Street was like a year round full-time job for everybody who, who worked uh, in the Muppet workshop. They did 130 episodes a season. And they, these are hour long you know, episodes. Uh, not the like 28 half hour episodes that they do now or whatever it is. Um, so, so they worked all the time. The season had just wrapped. They were all exhausted. Everything had just come back from the studio. All the puppets had come back for refurb. There were puppets lying all over the workshop. Everybody was dead tired and frankly, sort of giddy. And so having a visitor in the workshop who was a, a, an aspiring puppet, you know, student was okay with them. And Carolee Wilcox, the late lamented, um, she just yeah, passed she away just, a couple yeah, months she ago. Passed away in January. Yeah. Yes. Um, was the head of the Sesame Street workshop at the time, and she knew I was, you know, anxious to learn and all that. And and she said, "Well, why don't you just pick up a, a, a here here pick up a Muppet and try one on?" And the first Muppet I ever had on my hand was Grover. Cool. And I, and I put Grover on. And of course it was like a semi-religious experience. I put Grover on and I just kind of wiggled him around a little bit. And uh, to this day, I don't, I, I don't know really how this happened, but Carol Lee saw something in what I was doing that she thought was okay. And she said, you know, you should, you should try to audition for Jim. And I was like, yeah, right. You should probably say that to everybody who come, walks through this door. <laughs> But she meant it. And she gave me the contact information for Jim's personal assistant, who was the person who scheduled those kind of things at the time. And that's when that whole ball got rolling. And I, I had a pre-interview with Jane Henson, who was still involved at that time uh, with actively promo uh, um, looking for new puppeteers. And uh, 
she passed me on to the audition workshop process. And that's when I met Jim for the first time. And a few months later, I started working for his company. Mm. What was Jim like? A lot of people always have great stories about him. Well, you know, that's the thing. You, you can't, you, there's not enough you can say about Jim. I, I mean, he was, he was an amazing person. And, and in so many ways, F for one thing, of course, the, the first word that everybody always applies to Jim was that he was a genius. And yes, he was. He was a creative genius. I mean, he he changed puppetry for all time. I mean, if you go to Google and Google the word puppet, the first citation that's going to come up is going to be a Muppet. Jim changed puppetry. And for someone who had no previous training in puppetry and no real interest in it, for him to do that, then you know he was on to something. Jim wasn't an aspiring puppeteer. He was a person who aspired to work on television. He had the opportunity right, yeah. to work on TV if he did a puppet thing. So he like scraped together puppet things and he went and he got the gig, you know, that shows you how good he is. One of the things about Jim, of course, everybody uses the word genius and that's apt. The next word that everybody always, uh, you know, uh, will use when they're talking about Jim is he was generous. He was very generous. He was, um, interested in creating for people. He was interested in, in uh, giving people challenges and uh, allowing people to work through those challenges. But one of the other things about Jim was that he was good at everything he did. He was, he was remarkable. He, he, he wasn't just a successful artist. He was a successful businessman. He was very savvy about how to take care of his own interests and to develop and promote his business. Um, he did all those endless, endless local TV commercials, which you know most people would have found tedious and horrible, but they paid his bills and they were a creative challenge because they were only like 10 seconds long. How do you get all that information and everything? How do you make something memorable in like 10 seconds? Amazing, you know? And uh, so he was a very savvy businessman he was generous. He was a creative genius. He was very soft-spoken. And although he was driven, I think one of the unusual things about Jim was that he was not someone who was overtly ambitious. He was not somebody who just seemed to be like grinding away at the rat race to get ahead all the time. He wanted to do good work. He wanted to be well compensated for it. But the most important thing to Jim was doing good work. Um, so that that is remarkable because like a lot of people in the industry you run into, um, they're, they're, they're in it for the buck, they're in it for fame, they're in it for glory. And, but that's not what Jim was about. He, he just wanted to do good work. He wanted to be challenged. He wanted to be creative. He wanted to do good work. Um, one of the things that people don't fully appreciate about Jim or don't realize um, because they're not really familiar with the way the business works, entertainment business works, is that Jim put an enormous amount of his own money into everything that he did. He was constantly investing in his own projects. Uh, you know, you, you, you often hear about, you know, like big pharmaceutical companies or whatever, talking about R&D, you know, research and development. Well, Jim was always throwing money at research and development, only it wasn't just in a lab somewhere. It was on a workshop table and it was somebody cutting up foam and trying something new or, or trying different um, techniques for manipulating a puppet remotely or whatever. Um, and Jim put his own money into things um, I don't want to say indiscriminately, he, he put his money into things wholeheartedly. He, he didn't hedge his bets. He wasn't like only putting money into safe things. He put, he, he, you know, he bankrolled the whole Dark Crystal movie. That was an enormous leap of faith. You know, uh, a, oh, yeah. a fantasy movie without a single human character in it and a completely 100% real time live action puppet film nobody had ever done it before. And frankly, nobody has done it since. There, mm. there are still no live action creature movies that have no adult or no uh, humans in them. I mean, Jim's the only one who did that. And that was all his money. Um, I remember when we were doing the Jim Henson hour for NBC, 
Uh, we were doing, um, it was a real mishmash of a show. It was kind of, it was kind of called a variety show and that was so they could take advantage of some of the um, stuff in the can that the Henson shop had done, um, the storyteller things, episodes. And then there were, you know, episodes with uh, regular Muppet characters in it. And then there were special things like we did Dog City. Now Dog City was another, it was a TV special within the Jim Henson Hour show that had no people in it at all. There were no guest stars. There were no human beings. It was all puppets. And it was an extraordinarily expensive episode. I can because imagine. everything had to be built from scratch. It was a, a period piece. It was like, you know, um, a 1930s gangster movie. And so they built all these enormous sets and, um, you know, uh, puppet scale uh, uh, replica period cars, you know, and, and all this stuff. And NBC ran out of the money for the episode. And so Jim put money out of his own pocket in the episode just because he believed in Dog City. He wanted to do it. Wow. He to do it right. And that's one of those things that Jim did all the time. He was always putting his own money into things. Um, and another thing about Jim uh, was he was extraordinarily modest. He did not, he did not sell like, you know, it's so funny when Jim passed, one of the, what there were there were obviously it was terrible absolutely horrible and the first thing was everybody gasped the creator of the muppets is gone our our boss is gone but then there was this so there was this one huge wave of sadness and tragedy and it was a while i mean a long time before there was sort of a general realization that oh my god we also lost one of our best performers because Jim didn't promote himself that way. Jim wasn't like, oh, look at me. Look what a great puppeteer. Oh, I'm freaking Kermit the Frog. He just, he wasn't like that. The things that Jim was proudest of was his, you know, producing and his creative things. He didn't, he didn't, you know, he didn't flout his success as a, um, or flaunt, I should say. He didn't flaunt his success as a performer. Mean. And and he didn't, and he didn't uh, talk about himself like, oh, look at me, I'm a big fat star. He just didn't do that. So it actually was really weird. After Jim passed, they were like, oh my God, the guy who did Ernie and the guy who does Kermit and the guy who does Sweet Chef and the guy, he, the guy who did all Link, all, who did all these characters is gone now. Um, and it was sort of, it was this weird sort of ripple effect that people didn't sort of realize at first because he didn't promote himself that way. Um, but he was, and he was, like I said, he was good at everything. I mean, I'll, I'll never forget, we were doing the Muppet 3D movie. And we had that we were shooting at the as Ricky uh, enumerated quite uh, comprehensively in your interview with him. Um, we were shooting in the Walt Disney Studios out in LA, and um, for our, for part of the time they brought in a bunch of local LA puppeteers for the bigger crowd scenes. Although it was most of the things were shot with a small, you know, it was like the main Muppet crew and me and Ricky. Um, with the exception of Jerry Nelson, who was who was in still in New York, it was he was considered sort of too important for Sesame Street, and there weren't any major characters of his that ended up in the script. So Jerry sadly didn't come out for it. But anyway, um, so on the one of the days when all the L.A. local puppeteers were called in, one of the people by the name of Joseph Self, uh, who was there as an L.A. puppeteer, is also a clown. Um, and he rode to the studio or he brought to the studio with him a unicycle. And, you know, we were all just standing around on a break or as we were doing our meet and greet or whatever. And I forget how it happened. Either Jim volunteered it or somebody asked him to or whatever. But honest to gosh, Jim took up that unicycle, got out and rode around on it. I mean, he just, he, he could juggle, he could ride a unicycle. There was just like, he did stop animation. There was just like nothing that Jim put his hands in that didn't somehow work out. And he always made it look easy. One of the big differences, you know, people talk about the differences between Frank and Jim, because they were like, you know, oil and water, they, they are very different, but they, they meshed really well as personalities. And what they did together was so amazing. Um, their approach to work was always very different. You always got the feeling that Frank was working really hard and, and you could like see him sweat. And so Jim, it seemed like 
And you know, it was effort for him, but it always seemed effortless. He, he never, he never broke a sweat. He never seemed like stressed out. He was a Zen performer. He just had this ease of, um, uh, you know, just incredible. I've never, I've never worked with anybody like that. He just made everything look easy and his approach was easy. He was so easygoing and, and all those things. Sorry, that was a very long. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, that's, that's, that's all good. You, Those you are some great stories. You asked me about Jim Henson. You're going to get hours. Oh, I've I've heard tons of great Jim Henson stories from many great people, and I always love hearing what a genuine person one of my idols is. So, he was he was a remarkable person. I mean, to to for a puppeteer who grew up, you know, admiring his work for to to get the opportunity to work with him, and and experience firsthand his genius and his generosity and everything. And, and when I say generosity, I'm like, I'm not saying he's like throwing dollar bills at everybody all the time. He, he gave, like I said, he gave people opportunity and he believed in challenging people and he believed in giving people the chance to work through that opportunity. And th that generosity of his extended to his warming as well. I had the great good fortune of right handing. I did a lot of assisting for Jim because I was the new guy. Um, I did a lot of assisting. I did a lot of right handing for Jim. And one of the things, like I said, that contrast in style, when you, when you right handed for Frank, um, there were a couple of things. First, you could almost always count on him like holding your hand back down because <laughs> he, he was very, I don't mean to say controlling, but he was very controlling no um <laughs> but he had he had very strong ideas about what he wanted and you know who was who was going to lead things and he didn't want you to to be distracting and do too much and stuff like that you know because usually when somebody gets into the right hand their first their first inclination is like well i want to i need to be active i need to be you know i need to help bring the thing to life and they so they do too much and frank would like keep you from doing that <laughs> one of the things and, and then he was also Frank is a Frank is a smart guy and he never he never he's very intellectual. But the interesting thing about Frank is he's so smart. And yet when he's performing, he takes that smart and he can put it all aside and he performs with great abandon. He uh, he never does this, uh, the same line twice. And uh, his approach his approach every time every take is going to be a little bit different so you when you're right handing for Frank you're hanging on for dear life because you don't know what he's gonna do because he's very he's very spur of the moment you never know what he's gonna do he's not gonna he's not gonna add lib lines necessarily because he understands the importance of the script but his his movement what he does is gonna change every time Jim when you were right handing for Jim I sometimes like if I was doing right hands for Ernie on Sesame Street or something, I sometimes got the feeling that if I didn't gesture, Ernie would never move. Jim would give that person in the right hand the opportunity to contribute to the performance. Um, he wouldn't he wouldn't control the he wouldn't be like, well, I'm Ernie and I'm going to talk with my left hand all the time and I'm just going to gesture. He he very much believed that the other hand was important and needed to contribute. Like I said, sometimes he wouldn't do anything. He'd just wait for you to do something. Uh, so he was generous as a performer as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, Jim, Jim was remarkable and you could just talk about him forever. And I only worked with him for not quite three years. Ooh. And I had all those things to say about Jim, you know, anybody who had any length of time with Jim at all, is got a lifetime of stories to tell you know he was just remarkable just remarkable and i also had the very good very good fortune of um after after labyrinth was a box office disappointment jim jim had decided that he wasn't going to do tv production so much anymore and after fraggle rock wrapped which was 1986 um he didn't he wasn't really planning on working in tv he wanted to work on films and he had a lot of eggs in his basket on labyrinth labyrinth was a box office disappointment and it was notoriously at the failure box office failure quote unquote failure uh uh disappointment of labyrinth 
was famously Jim's blue period. He he took himself to the south of France and he went on vacation and he that's when he wrote his his famous letters to his children and his will and all that sort of stuff. Wow. Um, he was he was as about as low as Jim ever got. And Jim was publicly a very upbeat person all the time, but it was a, a difficult time for him. So there wasn't much going on in the Muppet universe. And at the end of 1986, um, and years before, Jim had promised a school for puppetry in France, in northern France, that he would teach a class there some, or do a workshop or whatever. And so the finally, the time came when he didn't have other commitments. There wasn't a lot of other stuff going on. And he said, yeah, I'll do your workshop now. I had the great good fortune being able to go to that workshop. Um, at the, and I had already started working for him. It was kind of, it's another one of those long winded stories that, of which I have many. Um, <laughs> I started working for Jim in January of 1987 and it was going to be the summer of 1987. I saw that he was going to do the workshop in France for two weeks and I sent it in an application. Because I was like, well, I'm working for Jim, I, but I don't have like any real history with him, no, no, no background. I want to, I want to learn more from Jim than I do just being in a studio with him. I want him to actually be my teacher. And so I sent him my application, and a, like a few weeks later, uh, we were doing something, and I wish I could remember what. I can't remember what we were doing. And I think it was like public service announcements or home video. We were shooting in the in-house studio, the the fabled uh, carriage house. And Jim came up to me on a break and said, I, I hear you uh, applied for the Charlottesville workshop that I'm doing. Um, I really don't think that's something that you want to do because you're already working with me and I'm not sure that you'll learn everything, anything from that. And so I was like devastated because I was like, oh, I really wanted to go to France <laughs> with Jim for two weeks. And so I was like, okay, well, I'll put that away. He doesn't think, you know, it would be worthwhile for me. And then like two weeks before the workshop was supposed to start, this is months later, it was during the summer, mm -hmm. two weeks before it was supposed to start, his personal assistant called me up and said, um, Jim was wondering if you were still interested in going to Charlottesville because he thought it would be a good idea to have somebody he knows there. Do you want to go? I, uh, and I was like, yeah, sure, of course I do. And um, so I was one of only two Americans who went to to uh, attend the workshop and it was an amazing experience just amazing because i i didn't just get to work with jim i i didn't get to just to see how he did what he does i got to learn about why he does what he does and i got to hear a lot about his philosophies and 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 in ways that you wouldn't get in a day-to-day -day environment in the studio, just working with them because, because you're working, you know, you don't have time for that kind of stuff when you're working. It was also interesting because what we would do, and Jim was so accessible, talk about generous. He was so accessible. He was with us from dawn until midnight. He, he came in in the morning. We did manipulation workshops. We built puppets. We, um, we did practicing uh, in front of the camera. And then at night after dinner, we would watch a bunch of his stuff and we'd all sit around and critique it. And he'd discuss with us, you know, what, what it was like working on it or whatever. And it was so interesting because we started with his early career and we went right up through Labyrinth. We went right up through his most recent stuff and we watched everything. And after, at the, during, during like the last day of the workshop, Jim said, I gotta, I gotta tell you, this has been a really interesting experience for me too, because I've, I'm not somebody who tends to look back. I don't look back at what I, where I've been, I'm looking forward to where I'm going. But this has given me an opportunity to sort of take stock in what I've done and to revisit my past work in a way that I've never done. So that was really, really interesting. And, and um, that, that time, that, that two week period in France that I got to study with Jim, uh, really like a, a, a lifetime highlight there that that time was incredibly precious and special it was really great to have that time um with him amazing uh do you remember the very first ever thing that you ever did for the muppets was it on sesame street was it for like another production no the very first thing i ever did and i can tell you uh it was january of 1987 i auditioned for jim in october of 1986 and in january or maybe it was in december i got the call um I got a call from 
from one of the production people there at Henson saying, we're doing some public service ads for the National Wildlife Federation. And Jim wondered if you wanted to come in and work on them. And that's the first thing I did. I played uh, Thomas Jefferson and Mount Rushmore uh, for a, <laughs> a National Wildlife Federation uh, public service ads. And we, and Jim did those like every year uh, for a long time. The, the, uh, we did some, we did some later. The first, the first celebrity quote unquote celebrity I ever worked with was for one of those national public service ads. Um, and it was, uh, we did some with John Denver. And so he was like the first big celebrity that I nice. ever, ever worked with. But then, so I did, I did that and I did a couple other things. And I honestly, I can't remember quite the, the timeline for all of those things, but um, because that was the midpoint in the season of Sesame Street. Sesame Street was already in season, so I are already uh, in production. So I, I couldn't work on Sesame starting that season, but I started um, in the late summer for the next season of Sesame Street, um, which was season 20. So that summer, um, I started, I well, in the spring, in the spring, they they were looking for somebody to stand in for Carol for stuff. They knew a bunch of 20th anniversary appearances and stuff to do. Uh, and Carol isn't available for all those things. And some of them he, he wouldn't just want to do because they were small potatoes, you know, they were long trips or, you know, corporate things, you know, because um, what, what the general public doesn't get to see is all the um, promotional stuff that the Sesame performers do with uh, corporate underwriters and stuff for Sesame Street. Um, there's all kinds of there's all kinds of things like if there's a if Fisher Price is doing a toy, you go to a Fisher Price you know convention and you make an appearance you know and that and those those kind of things that those are used to be anyway. There were a lot of those kind of things. Um, so that summer I um, I got a call from Kermit Love asking me to audition to do some Big Bird stuff. And so I started that summer and I started doing uh, live appearances. I think the very first live appearance I did was for WNET's, the, the New York City uh, public TV station's silver anniversary or something like that. And Carol wasn't available for that. And I went and did that. And that was a big star studded event at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. Um, and then that summer or fall, I guess it would have been the summer, um, I did my first, uh, thing for Sesame Street. I did uh, the uh, opening the, the title sequence stuff with, with Big Bird for season 20. And we did that all in uh, out in uh, out on location. It was like in Arizona. The big thing and the big push for season 20 on Sesame Street was to sort of expand where they had the characters appearing. So Big Bird went all over the country and we did little clips of Big Bird in not cityscape things we did like out in Arizona and, and stuff like that. But so I started um, that fall, I started in the working regularly on, on Sesame Street for the first time. And in addition to um, um, doubling for uh, Big Bird, uh, I have heard that you also puppeteered um, the Bluebird character for Sesame Street, which is a character that I've been interested in for quite a long time. Yeah, that was that's a that's a fabled failure. Um, I was that, talking I think, to I was talking to Norman Stiles about that because I think he wrote one of the appearances for that character. I, I'm sure he did. Uh, I I I'm not. You know that was a long time ago. So for for any uh, of the listeners who don't know, uh, and and you can find uh, both of these on YouTube. But um, uh, Norman wrote an episode where um, uh, it was the one where Maria told uh, Big Bird that she was pregnant with uh, with Gabby. And basically, how the storyline of that goes is um, Maria's is that the like sock snatcher one. That was the uh, what was it? Toaster fixer telephone oh, yeah. caller one. Toaster fixer upper. Yeah, which was Maria in a disguise because Big Bird was really really um, annoyed by the fact that Maria had some other things to do, and uh, Maria's like, "Why don't you write a story?" So Big Bird created Blue Bird, and um, <laughs> I honestly thought that those were really cool segments. <laughs> Well, the, the idea, the idea was it was all, it was all tied. And that was for season 20. That was all tied into, because they were like, well, we have this guy who's doing big bird, but let's have another bird character. Um, that was uh, all what they were, what they were trying to write about 
and encourage was children's imagination and children's, you know, like creative writing, even though these are like pre-writing kids, you know, age kids. Um, but they wanted to promote being creative and using your imagination. So the idea was that Big Bird was imagining using his imagination to make up this superhero character because superheroes, even back then, superheroes were getting to be a sort of a hot topic for, for kids. And so the, way, the idea was it was there. a superhero. By the way, to all you listeners out there, speaking of superheroes, stay tuned to the end of this uh, interview for a big announcement. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, like sorry being, to interrupt. Continue. That's all right. Nothing like being made part of a shill for your other show. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, so, so we, um, so they took parts of the Blue Bird from the Sesame Street movie, Follow That Bird. They they reused parts of his. Um, even then they were trying to think economically. They didn't want to build something for scratch. So they took parts of the big blue bird from the Sesame uh, Follow That Bird movie and they built a new head and new wings and new feet and uh, had this blue bird character. And we did, we actually shot three stories but only two ever aired. Um, one was the sock snatcher, which is placed in a laundromat, and then the, with uh, Sonia, and who was very pregnant with her daughter at the time. That's one of the reasons she's in those big overalls, because um, they were trying to cover her up. Uh, this was before they got married. So um, anyhow, uh, so I, I voiced the character when, when we shot it, and they were both, uh, both of those things were directed, both of those uh, the inserts were directed by John Stone. And the first one we did out on location, which was so much fun, run around with, so you know, Sonia out, out in Central Park or wherever we were. And uh, then the other one was shot in the studio. And um, somebody decided that, um, it, it was also during a time when they were rightly trying to um, have more African-American voices in the show uh and more representation and so they decided that since they'd kind of failed on other ways of introducing african-american content into the show that they would make the voice of big bird uh a, a black performer so i actually that's you don't get to hear my voice they dubbed it over with another performer uh um, reg e kathy yeah so um, yeah, and and so there was a lot of controversy. We they tried to make the episodes full of action because action movies and superheroes, you know, were appealing to kids in cartoon shows. So they tried to make those storylines with Bluebird more um, frenetic, more more action. And uh, there was a feeling from internally that maybe they were too violent and they were too mindlessly uh, frenetic and there was also carol's discomfort with having another bird character on the show so that kind of put the kibosh on bluebird and he didn't he didn't go anywhere after that although perhaps maybe off the set big birds coming up with his own bluebird stories that we just haven't seen yet well it's you know it's a shame that the idea didn't fly literally or figuratively <laughs> uh, no uh, pun intended it wasn't a bad it wasn't a bad idea um, mm -hmm. Dubbing over uh, the performance with a with somebody voicing it over after is never good because it always robs the performance of spontaneity. So that was a bad decision, probably. Um, I think that, you know the I think the main thing was that Carol was felt like having another big bird on the show diminished the stature of her uh, stature of his character. I think that's one of the big reasons that the, the character didn't go anywhere. Um, but anyway, so water under the bridge. You could, you could write a, an encyclopedia of failed Muppet characters on Sesame Street. There have been zillions of them. So when it comes to um, puppets like uh, Bluebird and Big Bird and also other like generic uh, Muppet characters that, uh, that you've done on Sesame Street or maybe just regular characters that you've doubled, doubled for, do you prefer body puppetry, like being inside of it, or do you prefer having it over your head while you're holding it on your hand? Oh, well, I mean, I, I enjoy both those things. It's doing, doing the body puppets, doing the some things like Big Bird and, and of course, doing Snuffy especially is extremely hard work. 
it, those things are heavy. It, it, it doesn't sound heavy when you say, well, how heavy is Big Bird's head? Well, like two pounds. That doesn't sound like much, but you put two pounds up over your head and keep your arms straight up over your head and flap your hand around. It's It gets heavy really fast. And the thing is that you can only have physically, it doesn't matter how strong you are, if your arm is up over your head for too long, all the blood drains out of it and your hand starts to go numb. So those huge characters are a great challenge. It is fun to be the whole thing. I always enjoy doing bird because you're the whole thing you know you're walking it's you're not just you're not just wiggling your arm your whole body is engaged and that's 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 cool you know and they're mighty impressive i mean the first time you walk into the studio and see big bird he's he's there's a reason he's called big bird because he's big he's enormous he's eight and a half feet tall i mean he's just huge that's and of course he's it. bright yellow so visually he just he just takes up so much visual space. So those those kind of characters are fun. They're extremely difficult. Um, one of the one of the hardest things is your vision is so different. Your vision is so limited. When you're performing on the street as a puppet character, of course you're always looking at a monitor. But if you're just doing a hand puppet, you still can look over there and see to your left. You can still you know. You can see, still have peripheral vision to other places. When you're inside Snuffy, for one thing, it's pitch black. When you're inside Bird, all you see is yellow. You have no peripheral vision. There's no, the only means that you have visually of seeing the outside world is what the camera is seeing, because you're looking in the monitor. So that's, that's very difficult to do. Uh, when you're doing something live outside, you know, uh, outside of the, figure when you're just doing a hand puppet you can look anywhere you need to so that makes it a lot easier but the challenge of on sesame street is always uh when you're working with people um they don't build up the set on sesame street the way they do for muppet show or things that are primarily puppet shows it's a show about people and so and kids so the puppeteers are always on little rolling stools and so your you the strain on your back and your shoulder and your abs is extraordinary. I mean, people who work on Gosh. Sesame Street as puppeteers rolling around on those carts all the time. I mean, your your knees, I mean, you're sitting on a stool on the ground, right? That's like this tall. So your knees, I, I try to show you on camera, which is hard. Your knees are always like up here. This is the position you're working from and you got to scoot yourself around. So you're holding yourself with your core all the time. And you can bet that everybody on Sesame Street who works regularly could outdo anybody in sit-ups because everybody's got to have an amazingly strong core to do that all the time. That's something you don't have to do on Sesame Street. I mean, uh, on things other than Sesame Street, if you're doing the Muppet Show, you can stand up. You know, because the set is raised and all the people are up on platforms, uh, but not on Sesame. There's no platforms on Sesame. Everybody's just scrounging around on the ground. I mean, there are shots, where, there are literally shots on Sesame Street to get big crowd things where the puppeteers are like lying on the floor, you know. So uh, that's that's a whole nother challenge. The, the physical challenge of scooting around and navigating a set that's built for people is it's that's a big challenge. Mm. I bet. Wow, sounds one of my favorite Jim Henson's. One of my favorite Jim Henson stories is um, on Sesame Street, because you know he, uh, he wasn't there all the time. He had two weeks right. a year that he would come in and do a few things. Um, we did this one bit with Ernie um, called "Best Friend Blues." It was song "Best Friend Blues," and it was Ernie. And Snuffy, Snuffy was singing about how sad he was that Big Bird was gone. And Ernie was singing about how sad he was that Bert wasn't there. And they had Ernie sitting on the uh, stairs in the arbor, which the set of, for which doesn't exist anymore. And um, so you had this huge Snuffleupagus and you had Ernie who was unusually seen full body, you know, you could, they put these big legs on him. And when Ernie has his legs on, he's an incredibly heavy puppet because Ernie is a big puppet. Um, so they had legs on him. And because we were working through holes cut in the stairs in the arbor, 
we couldn't do live hands like we would normally do for Ernie. So they actually start, stuck arm rods in them. And it was extremely awkward. And um, so it's Jim and me stuffed underneath the stairs in the arbor uh, with a puppet that's not being used the way it usually is because they wanted to see him full body sitting. And we had these tiny, tiny little holes drilled in the stairs that we put the arm rods through. And that's, that was the only way to manipulate his arms. And it was very, very awkward. And if, if it had been, you know, Jim's call, if, if he wasn't considerate enough to know that any minute lost in studio time to re-rig anything is money, Jim just went, okay, well, I'll just accept things the way they are instead of suggesting just let's do it another way that makes it easier. He was just like, let's do it this way. And he did the best he could. And if you look it up, look it on, up on YouTube. Um, I'll put best a link in the corner of the video if anyone wants to yeah. check it out. Best friend blues. But anyway, so it was very awkward and it was very difficult. And uh, it was the, <laughs> there was two times that I ever saw Jim sort of go, Ugh. And that was one of them. <laughs> we were during a break in the in the taping or whatever. He he just he didn't even look at me. He was just like looking at the monitor and he went, "This was hard." <laughs> well, he and, wouldn't he be used to it after all these years, I, though. I know, but it was it was an unusually hard thing. And uh, but it wasn't like he wasn't complaining. He was like, "This is hard." It wasn't like that. It was just like, "This is hard." Um, and the only other time I ever heard him sort of. He can't even call it a complaint because he wasn't complaining. The only other time I ever heard anything like that, we were doing some bit with Ernie, who again, it's a big, heavy puppet. We were doing some song where everybody was dancing around. And it was one of the things about Jim and his work with puppets is that he understands that the puppets are visually arresting in and of themselves. They are uh, interesting to look at. And so you don't need and you actually don't want a lot of edits. It's not like a music video. It's not like cut, 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 cut. Jim liked really long takes because he knew that it was fun just for the viewer just to be able to look at the puppets. So he didn't chop things up a lot. He liked lots of long, long takes. And so we were doing the song with Ernie and I can't even remember what the song was. Um, very few of the songs that I did with Jim became like, standards or anything like that these are all these are all things that were done and they stayed for a couple of seasons and they never used them again um i forget what it was we were doing but ernie was singing and dancing around and after i don't know the fourth or fifth take or whatever a very long takes jim brought his arm down with ernie and he went phew those are the only two instances that i ever heard that kind of thing from jim because he just never complained about anything. That's funny. Um, there's one character, uh, you did, a lot, obviously you did a lot of uh, one-off characters on Sesame Street. And uh, one of my very favorite episodes of the show is, um, and I've talked about this before in a video, but it was where Hoots the Owl was showing every- on Sesame Street. Yes, and yeah. uh, you were Bernie the Baker. Yeah, <laughs> that's, the only, that's the only time I ever got to actually sing in People in Your Neighborhood. I was so excited. Yeah. Um, was that meant to sound like Jerry Nelson? Because because it really does sound a little bit like Mr. Johnson and Simon Soundman a little. Oh, no, not at all. No, not at all. It was just it was just um, I, I you know, I can't I can't I can't even remember the voice. It was just my standard go to. Oh, yeah. You know, it was just a guy who was kind of in the front of my face. Uh, this kind of thing. It was like, oh, I need the dough. The dough. No, it, was, it was just. <laughs> It was just a guy whose whose voice is kind of you know like right in your face. Um, no, it's funny. A lot of people, a lot of people like that episode. A lot of people remember Nighttime on Sesame Street. It's because the because basically the whole format of the show was different. I think that's it was unique, you know, and I think that's one one of the reasons that people remember it so well. Mm. It was like you know doing a Christmas episode or something where there's snow. People just remember it because it was so different. Yeah, uh, that actually had, I did a video, uh, my favorite Sesame Street bedtime songs. And one of the songs that I mentioned was one that Oscar sang in it. Uh, and I was talking to Lou Berger about this. It went something like, uh, makes you feel that everything's all right to hear the grouchy music in the night. <laughs> Which, of course, was inspired by 
the music of the night from Phantom of the Opera. <laughs> Uh, since we're talking about the music of Sesame Street, uh, I was wondering if uh, you got to know Danny Epstein at all? Oh, so much good music. Oh, sure. I worked with Danny for years. And, and his daughter, Ivy Austin. Yeah, Ivy was a guest on this uh, podcast and is still a really, really good friend. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't had a chance to listen to that interview yet. No, gosh, she, she, did, she did singing. She did voices for decades, decades. She has, she has a wonderful... It's funny because, you know, no, again, she's one of those people that nobody knows who she is, but when you hear her voice on the show, you like almost instantly know it's her because she's got this wonderful, um, um, very bright, very colorful voice, you know, a great, great singing character voice. Mm, and she's such a lovely person, like one of the kindest people I've ever met. I, I've never, I've never met her. I just, you know, they were like, Here's the next track, and they'd start playing. And like, well, there's Ivy. <laughs> <laughs> Do you? Uh, a lot of the time, when I tell people at Sesame Street that I'm close friends with Ivy Austin, they often tell me stories about Danny Epstein. Do you have any in particular? I don't really. I mean, he was he was music supervisor, so um, he would often be in the studio. I mean, we would chat just like anybody else would, you know, like that. Um, but um, I I didn't, you know, because I wasn't a principal character on the show I, I wasn't you know always recording songs or I, just, I didn't have that kind of interaction I, I do remember one of my one of my favorite things and it didn't happen very often one of my very favorite things was every once in a while we when we'd have a guest star on they would have a live band in the studio um, they 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 do the thing live and um, that was always great fun of course he was always there for those um, but um, yeah, no, I, I didn't, you know, not being a principal, I didn't have all that much interchange with Danny. But of course, I certainly knew who he was and saw him all the time. Mm, yeah, everyone always says that he was such a, a sweet man. And that he was great. You, you know, somebody, somebody who deserves to be mentioned in terms of sweet guys who did music was uh, David Connor. He yeah, was a lot one of, of my, people talk about him too. He was he was one of my very very favorite people at Sesame Street. He he knew that I had studied music and that he had um, he appreciated that I appreciated the music. Uh, before I was a theater major at Penn State, I was a music major. I play saxophone and piano, um, so I'm I'm somebody who has studied music. And uh, whenever we would go in to do pre-records on songs, you know you know, third frog from the left or whatever I happen to be playing. Um, we we always we always had a good time and i and i got to work with dave um when he he did some shows with kermit love uh some live stage things uh that he wrote the music for um and uh that i did with kermit and uh we, uh, we always got to work together then too so i he i have an enormous dave was another one of those people you know the, the people who i respect so much and and who meant so much to me at Sesame Street are always the people, it's always the same kind of people. Dave was extraordinarily generous and he was enormously even tempered. Um, and you know, Sesame Street was chaos so often, especially when you got all the puppeteers together. And back in the day, there would be a lot of big sequences with a whole crap load of puppeteers. And um, you know, people, people sort of thrive on the chaos and you know, that's, that's, Part of being creative and stuff like that and when you're trying to just get people to sing good that can be hard <laughs> but dave always handled it so well and he was just so good at um um nursing people to a a, a good vocal performance on a song you know he was he was great and and, and a, an extraordinary he was a he was a gifted musician uh yeah, he played he he was a wonderful piano composers. player whenever oh, yeah. whenever we did you know, special events. I mean, like, you know, he was the one who was playing piano at, at Jim's memorial service. Um, uh, Dave, Dave was extraordinary. And he also wrote great songs. It's a shame that they didn't do more of them on Sesame Street, um, but they already had their sort of stable of, of guys who were responsible for writing songs. Dave was a great composer too. He wrote some beautiful songs for these Kermit Love shows that I worked on. Um, he, his 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 stuff should have been heard more, but mm -hmm. anyway, yeah. love Dave, yeah, love Tom's, Dave. Tom Spawn told me that they always refer to him as one more time Dave. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, that's, you know, that's the way it goes in a studio, you know, when <laughs> either when you're recording or when you're doing something for video, or whatever, it's like one more time. And then you get, you do that one more time. You're like, you know, maybe we could be one more time. Well, you know, we get, okay. One more time. You know, maybe we didn't quite get it one more time. <laughs> you know, yeah, that happened was, a lot. Yeah. I, it happened. Go ahead. A good example of that. And it's, and it's a, and it's an insert that a lot of people like, um, is the Oklahoma insert uh, with Kermit and with uh, Forgetful Jones. We did that stinker. That was a long, long bunch of shooting. Talk about long shots. Now go back and look at that video and see how many shots there are. There aren't very many. They're all incredibly long takes. We did that opening take and it's all one long take for much of it. We did that opening one long take for like, I don't know, like 34 times or some ridiculous number like that. Um, and it was very active, you know, with all those stupid horses and cows dancing and all that sort of stuff. You know, Jim was on on set doing Kermit and he was like, I, I think we can get it better. And so we just did it again. And then we did it again and we did it again and we did it again. And, and in the final take that we did, Marty flubs his last line, but everything else was good. So we were just like, okay, well, that's the one we're going to buy. And Marty was like, ah, that's the thing about working on TV, man. You don't get to pick which take they use. Your best take is not necessarily the one they're going to use. It may not be the best for lighting. It may not have been the best take for sound, or it may not have been the best take for somebody else. So you're, you have very limited amount of control in what goes out to your audience when you're working on TV. It's not, it's not up to you. Um, there's a whole big ball of other considerations. Uh, one of my, one, and I know you've talked about, Ricky, a lot about this, the Muppet 3D movie for Disney. And that was a great project to work on. It was just the only, the only two other puppeteers beside the main set of people for that were me and Ricky. Right. And again, long takes, really long takes. Uh, the other 3D movie that had been at Disney and it was actually still at Disney when we were filming ours was Captain EO, the Michael Jackson 3D movie. Right. And one of the one of the things that Jim noticed about that movie when he watched it was it was cut like a music video. Lots of quick takes. Cut, 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 cut. And what that does is it doesn't allow your eye to get used to, it doesn't give your brain a chance to process the 3D effect. So it actually minimizes the, the 3D effect. So Jim was like, I'm going to do really long takes. And so we did. The takes that we did were endless. And we did that opening shot that, that Ricky talked about with uh, Gonzo at the door with the 3D logo. And then the door opens and Gonzo's there. And then Kermit keeps walking and there's Zoot in the ironing board. And then he, Kermit keeps walking. And then there's the big hallway. And we did that thing like 40 some odd times. It's not like a ridiculous number of takes in one of the hottest stretches of weather in that California had ever seen under these enormously hot lights because the film speed for 3D cameras was slow. This was back when there was physical film, not video. Um, so we all played different things. We all played several things in that one shot. Like Ricky was assisting Gonzo and then he came out, then he'd run under the set and get into Sam Eagle. He'd pop out the door of Sam Eagle and do a line with Sam Eagle and then put Sam Eagle down then run around the set and get over to assist Beaker. And that's all one shot. Okay, we're, so we're God. all doing mother. I did Zoot with the ironing board. Then I ran around the back of the set. I did Piggy poking out the door then I put her down and I ran over and I was in Bunsen's right hand. So it, if any point, any of those things went wrong and there were live chickens they were throwing onto the set, there was, if anything went wrong, we'd have to start all over again. And it didn't matter where in the shot it happened, we'd have to all go right back to the beginning. There was, so where there were frequently times when you do zoot with the ironing board and you'd go running back and you'd get into piggy and then you'd hear cut you know, and then you have to go back and start all over again. That was, that was a, that was a quite a fun shoot to work on because it was uh, in many ways, a reunion. Um, of course, Frank was there, which he hadn't been doing a lot of performing at that point. Um, 
uh, and uh, the director of photography was uh, Izzy, and I'm going to get his last name wrong, Mankowski, who was the cinematographer for the Muppet movie. So it was a big kind of reunion thing. And it was the same, and it was the same with the Muppets at Walt Disney World. It was a big reunion kind of thing. The guy who did the music for the show was the guy who did the music for the Muppet show years before. The guy who directed it was the director from the Muppet show. Um, some of the wranglers that worked on it were people that had wrangled the Muppet show that Jim hadn't seen for years. It was, it was a big, the, even the lighting director, the lighting director for the Muppets at Walt Disney World was the lighting director from the Muppet show. So it was a big happy family reunion kind of thing. Uh, it was a, another one of those projects that was great fun to work on. It's great. Uh, do you have any um, celebrity stories from guests who have come on Sesame Street? You were talking a little bit about uh, when guests would come on uh, oh, yeah. when, and Danny Epstein would be there. Are there any that you really enjoyed working with? Well, all of them. Pretty much. That's a good um, answer. <laughs> the, uh, well, no, I mean, you know, the the thing about the people who come on Sesame Street who are celebrities are there because they want to be. You know, they're they're not they're not people who are like, well, this is a job. I have to be here. You know, they're people who want to be. They're either either they have kids that want them to be there, so they're trying to make their kids happy, and they want so they want it. But nine times out of ten. It's just they just they enjoy Sesame Street or they're somebody in their family does and they just want to be there. The first celebrity on Sesame Street that I ever worked with and we shot a bit uh, uh, out of season. It was actually the first thing for Sesame I ever shot was with Linda Ronstadt when she was doing that songs of my uh, grandfather thing where she was singing all those um, songs in Spanish and stuff. We did the Charo song and she was the first celebrity that I, I worked with at Sesame and she was so delightful because of course she knew Jerry Nelson was there and of course she knew all the Muppet performers from when she'd been on the Muppet show and she was just chatty 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 she was so sweet she was so nice she was great she was great one of my one of one of the celebrities who I was so impressed with well there's so many oh my gosh um because that's the thing there's so many celebrities on Sesame Street um um Nora Jones was great. She was oh, I love wonderful. Nora Jones. She was she was great. She was great. Um one of the things about Nora Jones is like she um she's largely promoted as a singer, you know? And that's like like her image and and Diana Krall, same. She was also on the show and I got to work with her. Diana Krall and Nora Jones both are people whose image has become wrapped in like how good looking they are and what good singers they are. They're actually both really amazing piano players. They're really great musicians. And so to have Diana Krall there noodling around on the piano and to have Nora Jones there playing piano was amazing. And it, and it gave you insight into uh, a, 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 a talent and, and a gift that they had that wasn't up front and center, you know, uh, as much as it probably should have been. But, you know, that's how, that's how, you know, that's how pop music works. You know, popular music trades off of image and all that stuff. You know, it's the sultry singer sort of thing, but boy, they're both really great musicians. They both play really well. One of my, one of my most vivid memories of a celebrity is when Ray Charles came on for the um, uh, 20th anniversary um special and did being nice. green and Love and i mean ray charles dude i mean is there anybody who had a more storied career than ray charles and um he came in and he had he did by the, by the way this is one of those things where he had a live band they didn't pre-record that or anything but he had a live band on on the stage so they played that live and so uh you know you you may remember that that if you look it up, look up that insert. It's it's it starts with a close up of him, and then the camera pulls back, and you find out that he's surrounded by monsters in a rainbow of colors, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Elmo doing, being, uh, being green, Elmo yeah. being one of them. But it's you know orange and green, and it's all and it's and Elmo's the um, I can't remember. I don't is Telly part of it? I can't remember. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna look it up. I don't I don't actually remember. Um, I know Cookie was there because David Rudman, in in sort of a uh, a reminiscent you know 
premonitions of, of him eventually taking over the character. David was in Cookie Monster, I think. But anyway, so Elmo was the, you know, at the keyboard. And I was right at Ray Charles's. I was next to Fran Brill, but I was right next to his left elbow. And in between takes and to get the sound right and stuff like that, he would just, he, you know, he'd just play stuff with the band. He would just like noodle around. He would just improvise, you know, and just, and the band would just play just to, just to pass the time while they were waiting, waiting for lighting or whatever. And, and I just, I just sat there in awe of the man just without even thinking, just sitting there playing, you know, they, they had not decided the, what they were going to play. They were not playing a specific, they were just improvising. And all this, all this magic was going. And I, in my head, I'm going, I sure as hell hope somebody's running tape because this is just remarkable. He's just, he's just goofing around. He's just noodling around and it's art. You know, it's so good. And when they stopped, I even said, I couldn't help myself. I was inches away from him. I, I, I looked up at it and I said, man, you're noodling around. You're goofing around is better than most people's finished performances. And he laughed. And that was, that was a big moment for me where Ray Charles will laugh at something. And I said, I just uh, looked at a picture from it. Uh, doesn't look like Telly was there. No, I think it's, I, it's mostly like generic monsters. It's, it's and, not. And Frazzle was there. I did see him. Yeah. <laughs> ah! yeah, cause, yeah Cause he's, because he's one of the only orange characters they wanted to have orange, so you got to have a frazzle, you know? Yeah. Uh, let's move on a little bit from the Muppets. I would like to talk a little bit about Men in Black, and my question about that has something to do with me being a huge fan of the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Like, I friggin' <laughs> love the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. So my question about Men in Black is, um, was Will Smith funny? Oh, well, he was great fun to work with. Uh, you have to understand that... Um, Oh, well, I shouldn't say you have to understand. It was really interesting what happened on Men in Black. Men in Black um, was sort of, uh, nobody had predicted that that would be an enormous, huge hit. Um, they, had all, they all kind of figured it would, you know, it might do good. But while we were filming, now the New York puppeteers, very, very little was done in New York with the puppeteer. Um, most of the puppet stuff was done on set in LA. But the one, the one location thing uh, in New York with a puppet was uh, when the Regic baby gets birthed out of the car and that whole scene where it, you know, he, uh, he ejects out of the car with it in his lap and it throws up on him. So that was, that was all New York puppeteers and Rick Baker's crew from LA because uh, um, several of his crew people uh, were helping manipulate as well. But the, but the key functions were New York puppeteers. I had got that job, by the way, um, Tony Urbano from LA, who's somebody I've known for ages, um, cast around uh, for New York puppeteers to work on the thing. And I sort of got cast mostly on the fact that I, I auditioned, I, I, I was going to do the voice of the alien baby. I was doing the mouth. And um, because it was figured that, you know, it would be somebody who'd perform the, the thing live. And so it was me going, ah, 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 ah. you know, um, that. that's how I got, that's how I got cast. And then when we got to shooting it on location, the director was like, no, 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 don't, don't do that. ILM will put some monster voice in there. Don't, don't do it. So I actually ended up performing silently, which was kind of ironic. But um, while we were filming our part, which was happening on the 4th of July. It was, it was a holiday, but we were filming in Liberty State Park in New Jersey, outside of New York City. And it's kind of creepy because you can see it featured in the background in those shots very prominently is the World Trade Center, uh, which of course isn't there anymore. Um, but we were filming on the 4th of July out on location and and the director hated location stuff. He hated it. He didn't like, if a plane flew over, he was like, Argh! he hated filming on location. He, he liked studio stuff where it was more controlled. Um, but we were filming out on location and you probably don't remember that the 4th of July that, that we were shooting is when the film Indipse released. And it was a huge hit, huge hit. And like overnight, Will Smith became a million dollar movie star. When he was doing Men in Black, he was on like scale like everybody else. But on 
the 4th of July of that year that we were shooting Men in Black, he became a bankable star with a capital S. So when we were working with him, it was before he was a star <laughs> with a capital S. And he was great. Was one of my, one, yeah, one, well, he'd been in a couple of things other than that, but he, he was great to work with. Uh, I, he didn't, he didn't like the slop. He didn't like the slime and the goop. He hated it. He hated it. And so we knew we were only get one chance to throw up on him. We knew that we had, that was a make or take, we, you know, make or break take. We had to get it right. And we only had one chance. There were like three cameras pointed in them all at once. Cause there was only going to be one time to do it. Cause he hated the slime. Um, Tommy Lee Jones loved it. But <laughs> Will, Smith, Will Smith hated it, but he was very friendly. And while we were setting up and he had the alien baby in his arms, he knew we were all puppeteers. So he said, yeah, I remember I loved that. I used to love that show Fraggle Rock. And he started singing the theme song from Fraggle Rock. He's sitting on, sitting on a lawn in Liberty State Park in New Jersey on the 4th of July with an alien squid baby in his arms. And he's singing the song. He's singing the theme to Fraggle Rock. That was a great moment. I was, I was surprised that he wasn't singing in West Philadelphia, born and raised on the playground. It's where I spend most of my days chilling he, out. Max. He, he probably would have if we'd encouraged him to, but you know. I totally would have been like, dude, sing the Fresh Prince of Bel Air theme song. I'll do it with you. I know all the work. Well, words. you know, we were working, so. <laughs> I don't care. I would have done it regardless. Um, and you also uh, were, were uh, Cheryl Blaylock, it describes it as an ensemble puppeteer. You were an ensemble puppeteer on Bear in the Big Blue House and Between the Lions. Yes. And uh, yeah. so just like on Sesame Street, I, I was in assisting people and standing in for people and that kind of stuff. Um, I was not a principal character. I wasn't I wasn't uh, there every day. I only got called in when they needed somebody, you know, or whatever. But um, I, I, I loved working on both those shows. Nice. Again, nice thing about Bear in the Big Blue House, um, race set. It was dangerous for Noel because he's walking around on a race set with big holes in it for the puppeteers to be up. But uh, we didn't all have to roll around on the floor like on Sesame Street. And Between the Lions was strictly a race set. It was all over, over your head stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, one of those shows... Uh, Between the Lions was so on point with its curriculum, and it was so clever, and and they and they experimented with a lot of different kinds of puppetry on the show. There were rod puppets and marionettes. There are lots of different things. Um, it's a shame that that show didn't get enjoy better traction. Um, it was a it was a really good show, and the and the puppets all look so good. Of course, designed by Michael Frith and built by uh, Jim Krupa and 3D Design. Mm. Um, great, great stuff. Mm, nice. I saw a picture on your uh, website of um, you and Tigger in Book of Pooh, and oh, yeah. yeah, I love that show. Like, I'm a big, I'm a big Disney kid. I've actually met Jim Cummings, who does Winnie the Pooh and Tigger currently. Oh yeah, yeah, we met at a, a Disney convention in Los Angeles. I met Peter Linz there as well, and uh -huh. <laughs> that was pretty nice. Um, and uh, I was, I was kind of wondering. Uh, speaking of Tigger, if you were ever a fan of Paul Winchell, the ventriloquist, who was the original Tigger. Oh, heck yeah. Uh, you know, that's one of the things that I, you know, I didn't, I didn't mention is, is part of my early influences. Some of the puppets that I was seeing on TV when I was a kid were, there used to be a lot of ventriloquists on TV, uh, Paul Winchell being among them. Uh, Jimmy Nelson was one of them as somebody who people don't really know of anymore. But um, Paul Winchell and Jerry Mahoney and Knucklehead Smith, uh, Paul Winchell was a great, huge influence. One of my one of my very first books that I found in the library about building puppets was his book, Paul Winchell's book about how to be a ventriloquist. And there was there are chapters in the book dedicated to how to build a ventriloquist dummy. And so his work is some of the earliest stuff that got me making puppets, even though it was like paper mache and stuff like that. It was still an important influence. And the idea that somebody would help impart knowledge about how to make a moving eye or something, you know. So, yeah, no, I'm a huge, huge fan of, of, of Paul's. Um, if you got a second, I'm going to go get something that I think you'll think is really cool. Okay, yeah, cool. I'm, I'm at my shop, by the way. Like I said, the, the ventriloquists on TV were some of the earliest puppeteers that I remember seeing on TV. So 
Paul was definitely one of those people. And one of the things about Paul was he had that great voice. Paul was sort of like, Paul was sort of like Jerry Nelson. Um, his, his vocals were very distinctive and he was a really great actor. What he did with his voice was really great. This is how much I like Paul Winchell. I have a I have a replica Jerry Mahoney ventriloquist figure. Oh, that's how that's how much Paul's work has meant to me over the years. I can just hear I can just I can just hear him now going don't holla don't holla. So that's a lovely lovely figure that I acquired just in, within the last year or so. There was that's a fella amazing. by the name of Jerry Lane who has sadly passed who was making a replica. Um, Paul Winchell characters, and I got wow, I got wow, really, that is that is it's amazing. A, it's just a lovely character, great, yeah. you know, great mechanics and everything. And that's that's one of the other things about Paul. Um, you know, he was he was very he was very typical um, of 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 somebody who worked as a puppeteer. He he built figures too. You know, he he didn't. He doesn't, I mean, the original Jerry Mahoney was uh, carved by somebody else, but he built, he built puppets. He, he built, uh, he took a, a knucklehead Smith is actually built out, knucklehead Smith, I should say, is actually built out of a Jerry Mahoney copy that he, that uh, Paul had had made and he changed it. He, oh. he yeah, he, uh, he like added a, a pointy nose to it and he carved it up a little bit and he took off his hair and he made his head a little pointy and stuff. But Paul did that. And so Paul, Paul was somebody who knew how to build things and he knew how to make mechanics and stuff like that. Um, you know, your, your average television puppeteer nowadays is somebody who's somebody, somebody who is strictly a performer. You know, um, you don't get people who do everything uh, very often anymore. Hmm. Uh, so before we wrap it up with some fan questions, uh, I'm wondering how did you get involved in Avenue Q? Cause you said you did, um, designing and building puppets and also performing did you know somebody who was working on the show or did you like hear about it how did it all come about oh no I predate, well I, I predate avenue q avenue q is partly happened because i knew jeff and bobby um so jeff and bobby this is also a long story jeff jeff and bobby knew each other from the bmi musical theater workshop um jeff had been an intern briefly in the music department at sesame street before he got fired uh, for too aggressively promoting his own songs. They were like, no, look, I write songs. No, go make copies, Jeff. No, no, but really I make songs. Listen, there's no Jeff, go do, go make copies. But I write songs, you're fired. <laughs> um, so that was Jeff's history with Jeff Marks's history with Sesame Street. But because he was an intern at Sesame Street, he got to know people in the studio. And one of the people he got to know was Laura McLean, who is a famously uh, one of the best wranglers at Sesame Street and one of the most longstanding wranglers at Sesame Street. Jeff and Bobby were writing stuff at the BMI Musical Theater Workshop. Um, the BMI Musical Theater Workshop is exactly that. It's a workshop for aspiring musical theater composers and lyricists. And you, you study with a mentor and you play your stuff for your peers and you get peer input and stuff like that. And uh, that's what it is. So Jeff and Bobby met there and they'd been writing one of their final projects for, the, for their first year was they were writing a spec Muppet musical called Kermit, Prince of Denmark. And um, when, you're, when you're in the BMI Musical Theater Workshop, you can you write stuff, it's all academic. So you don't have to have the intellectual property rights for anything that you write songs for. It's all just a you know academic exercise. So Jeff and Bobby were like, okay, let's write a Muppet musical because we both love the Muppets. Well, they'd been writing this thing in class and it had been going very well but they were like, well, we're writing for puppets, but we're singing the songs in class and we should really, you know, it'd be cool. Let's get somebody to come in and sing a song as Kermit for our class. And Jeff contacted Laura and was like, hey, do you know anybody who, who does a Kermit impersonation who would come and do this for our class? And Laura, who's somebody I've known for years, um, contacted me because she knows that I'd stood in for Jim doing Kermit at various and sundry times and, uh, you know, and had a lot of respect for, for Jim's work and everything. 
And so she called me up and said, oh, hey, I got, there's this guy named Jeff who was writing this. Stuff. That's my Lars impersonation. <laughs> Who's writing this song uh, for Kermit? He wondered if you wanted. So make a long story short, I met Jeff and Bobby because one of the things that I've, I've sort of predicated my career on is never saying no. You always say yes to anything that might be an opportunity. If, at least you, you never say no without learning more about it. So I said, sure, I'll meet you. I met them. I listened to their song. I was like, you know what? That's a great song. Uh, not only is it a good song, but it's a great song for Kermit. They understood the Kermit character very well. So I said, yeah, sure. I'll do your song in class. So we sang, I sang the song for the, their class. The class went crazy. Their mentor for the class loved the work. And so we went on and developed that piece to a full length piece. We eventually ended up pitching, pitching it to Henson. This was Brian by this time. Uh, who said, no, nah, we don't do Muppet musicals anymore. Not interested. So they were like, well, why are we writing stuff for Muppet characters? Let's make our own characters. And that's how Avenue Q was born. So I actually, the fact that I knew Jeff and Bobby is what made it possible for them to write a thing with puppets because they knew me. Uh, so I was with Avenue Q before it even existed. So I was right there from the very beginning. Mm. Uh, and as you said, you designed and built all of the puppets. Do you prefer building puppets or performing puppets? Oh, well, I mean, performing is always more fun because because right. you get audience feedback. You know, the, the relationship before, between a performer and an audience is something that's unique in all the world. There's nothing like it. Um, they can be terrible, which is not good, but usually they're great. And you get, you know, and you get feedback from the audience, which inspires your performance. Um, when you're building a puppet, a lot of times that's the end game. You know, you build it, you pass it off and bye, it's gone, you know, and you never even see it again. Um, or a lot of times you'll build a puppet and you don't actually get to perform it. So, I mean, I, I sort of became a puppet builder by accident. I, I had to build puppets because I couldn't get the Muppety kind of puppets that I wanted to at a store. I had to build them myself or I wouldn't have what I needed to use. So I had to learn how to build the tools that I wanted to use. Um, and it was only with Avenue Q and having to build literally hundreds and hundreds of copies of these characters that I sort of became really well known as a, a as a builder and, and started building things for other people up until Avenue Q I really basically had only ever built anything for myself, you know. Hmm. Okay. I just want to get Nikki, Nikki on camera. Oh, hey, Nikki. Hey, James, how you doing? I am well. I, I'm kind of, I'm too, I'm overexposed. Let me, let me turn, Rick, turn down the light. There, that's better. How are you doing? I am well. I love your sweater, an old Navy sweater. Oh, thank you. I think you have the same kind of microphone that Rick does. Do you have one of those blue USB mics? Yes, a Yeti mic. Yeah, Yeti. My, his is silver. I like the black one. Mm. For a minute, I thought you were going to, for a minute, I thought you were going to say we have the same shirt. Uh, are you a Simple Plan fan? Mm, I don't know. No, usually, usually my shirt doesn't say Old Navy. Usually it says New York. Oh. But anyway, I, nice. I'm, I'm slumming. I'm, I'm wearing a brand name right now. I don't, I don't usually wear brand names. But anyway, well, it looks I got to go. Right? All right, because oh, cool. I, I know Rick talked too much, and uh, he took up too much time on, camera, on, on, the, on the mic here. So see you later. <laughs> Great seeing you. Yep, and you too. Uh, don't forget to write. <laughs> All right, so before I make the big announcement, it is time for da, 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 fan questions. How do you have fan questions on something that isn't live? <laughs> I, I, I announce uh, these shows on Facebook and I say, if, oh, anybody, okay. if anybody has any fan questions, send them See, to me. See, you're too smart. You're just too smart. <laughs> All right, so the first one here comes from Robert Wallace, and Robert wants to know, what was it like to have all the Sesame Street Muppets in the movie theaters for the don't, I almost said don't eat the pictures, don't forget to watch the movie policy and where was it filmed? Yeah, the, the, uh, we, did, we did two of those and I can't, I, I have a tough time remembering which one's rich. The first one that we did was the one that I worked on. I didn't work on the next one. Um, no, 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 not the movie. movie. Don't, don't forget, forget to. Yeah, I was in the count for most of that movie. Oh, cool. um, um, yeah, sitting next to Fran Brill. Uh, those were not shot at the Sesame Studio. Those were shot at Silver Cup Studios. Um, and uh, um, it was, you know, a huge number of puppeteers. There were extra puppeteers. Um, everybody was doubled up. I'm trying to remember. I think you'll have to look at the video. 
if you can find it, I think I had the count on one hand and a penguin in the other. I can't, <laughs> I can't quite remember. I know it was something. I, I remember I had a big puppet and a little puppet. That's all I can remember. Um, for the big for the big crowd shots, everybody was everybody was doubling up. Um, that was one of the that was one of the first times that I wasn't doing Big Bird. I think Matt did did Bird for that. Uh, it was one of Matt's first like on camera things with with Big Bird. Um, yeah, those were fun. I mean, that song, man. Once you get that song in your head, you can't you can't get rid of it. But it's the same you know. with a lot of classic Sesame Street songs that are really upbeat. Um, yeah. Like there's one that you sang in that that uh, I have a hard time getting out of my head. Uh, in a barn in the USA, in a barn in the USA. That's a good one. That's another, oh, another. There you go. That's I believe that was Chris Surf. Chris Surf and Emily Kingsley. Yeah. Both yeah. of whom I've had on here. <laughs> yeah. Um, next question comes from Vestin Bruno, who is asking, and I kind of wonder this too. Actually, I never would have thought about it until uh, he had sent it to me. But he's wondering. What did you do in the New Year's Eve special? Which one? It was it was where um, it was it, Lou Berger had written it. Uh, they were waiting for the ball to fall off Wolfgang the Seal's nose when it was going to be midnight, and Elmo was broad was showing what people do for New Year's all over the world with all these international Sesame Street characters from the, all the co-productions. I don't think I worked on that one. Oh, like. Your name is in the credits. Is it? Yeah. I don't know. You know, there's so many, there's so many of those kinds of things that sort of seemed kind of same for, for backup people like me, where we're just in a cry or whatever. Um, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't remember it offhand because, because, you know, as a utility puppeteer, I wasn't in on the whole shoot. I was only in a few days or whatever. So I was probably only in a big crowd scene. Like, Oh, I think that was the one. I think that was the one where in the big crowd scenes I'm in Bert and Ernie in the big crowd scenes where people had to have two puppets. And then ironically in the scenes that are medium shots, I'm in Bert and Eric Jacobson was in Ernie. This is long before anybody had thought that he was going to be taken over Frank's characters. Oh. So was listening I to Eric do his Jim Henson impersonation and Bert was me. I don't remember Eric's name being in um, the credits of the New Year's Eve special, but I think you and it Eric might, were... It might not have been that special. Like I said, I, I can't I think what I, what I think it was, it maybe it was Elmo Palooza because you're both credited in that. That was the one with John no, Stewart. No, not Elmo Palooza. And Elmo Palooza, I, I spent the, in the big finale number, I'm in the count. Okay, cool. Nice. Um... And that's another show that I wasn't in every day. I was in only a couple of scenes like that, that big, that huge, big finale number. Um, I, you know, I can't, I can't remember for sure. We did so many of those things that, you know, for the, for, for somebody who isn't a key performer, who's just coming in to do right hands and crowd scenes and like that, there's not much to tell apart from those things for, for me. I, I'll tell you one show that I remember very well in doing all the crowd things and everything because I was there every day is when we did the 20th anniversary special for Sesame that was part of the Jim Henson hour that was that was a really cool shoot um that was very memorable that was fun nice um final fan question here comes from Anthony Thompson and he's asking how did you become the go-to puppeteer for Steve the Stephen Colbert late show which I love <laughs> I think that that show's hilarious Thanks. Yeah, I've been on there eight times now. I was just there last week uh, for their first show back, which was great fun. Uh, I performed the talking pants. And, um, and uh, that, that, that was one of those things that, that came sort of circuitously. Um, the first time I got called in, they were doing, um, they were doing the, um, the first thing I did was the alien uh, chestburster thing, the Sigourney Weaver um, alien parody thing. That was the first one they called me in for. And they had talked to, Tom Spina had provided them with some of their proppy doodle things like, you know, face huggers and stuff like that. Um, and and uh, 
they were like, we need a, we need a puppeteer. We want to do the chest burster thing. So Tom actually recommended that they contact me. So that was my first contact with them. And then I think, I think the second thing I did was the Yoda one I did, uh, Yoda on, on meth. Um, I think that was the second one I did. <laughs> and so, so the, since I'd puppeteered the alien thing, they, they were like, well, we need a puppeteer. Let's call Rick. And so every time they've needed a puppet thing, they, they're, they're calling me now, which is, which is great. Because it's a great place to work. It's a great crew. Stephen Colbert himself is amazing. He's so smart. He's so oh, smart. Yeah. He, and, he's not, and he's not just like a hired hand. He's, his role as executive producer on the show, I mean, he's involved with that show. People don't appreciate that. He doesn't just like walk in, read a teleprompter, and then leave. He's there in the morning, he's there all day, and then he tapes the show. And then frequently after the show is taped, he does more stuff uh, with his you know, executive producer and writer hand, because he's a, he's a contributing writer to the show as well. Um, right. But for example, just to give you an example, I was there one day, and I think it must have been for the Yoda show. Um, I was there one day, because Yoda, a lot of the stuff that I've done for the show has been pre-taped. The, the cold openings are usually pre-taped, like the pants, talking pants thing was pre-taped. I did the uh, Kermit auditions thing, that was pre-taped. Um, uh, I did the Big Bird auditions, that was also a pre-taped thing. Those are two the, of my favorites. Uh, the, the, the nasty Kermit contract negotiations things, that was also pre-taped. Uh, that wasn't live, but the, the Yoda thing, I talked to Steven live. So that was a, that was a live thing. Obviously the alien baby thing was live because I literally had my hands up his pants, you know, to make the alien burst. Um, uh, one of the, show, it must've been the Yoda show. He did his opening monologue. And then while like during a commercial break or something, cause they taped normally like four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, while the show was being taped, there was a big news event that happened. And so while the show was happening, all the writers were working on, because you know the, the late night shows are trying to be topical. They're trying to be up, last, up to the minute all the time. And so while, after this big news story hit, while the show was going on, they were all rewriting a new opening monologue for him. And every commercial break, they'd come in and they'd consult with him about, well, let's do the, no, let's do it this way. And, uh, and then they'd go away and they'd do the rest of the show. And then after the taping of the show, he went back and he taped a whole new opening monologue. Oh my God. It all was written in that hour or whatever it takes for them to produce the show. I mean, it was amazing. And that's the kind of stuff that they do all the time. So Steven's really right on top of it. And he's delightful to work with. Um, when I did the talking pants thing uh, this past week, um, he, as he was leaving after he'd done his bit, he made sure he talked to the director producer and he was like, now you're going to get close-ups of the pants puppet, right? He, he wanted to make sure that it looked good and that the people got to see it, you know? And, um, you know, some, some star who just is just there for the paycheck and just coming in and out and reading their lines and then getting out of there to go take their coffee break or whatever, doesn't act that way. Uh, so he's, it's great, great show. I've been, I've been very lucky to, to get to work on it. I mean, I've been on that show, like I said, eight times now, and I've been cut twice. So I've actually done more things than the public's ever seen. Um, I mean, who else on their resume can say that on national TV, they've been Kermit, Big Bird, and Yoda, you know? So that was one of the funny things about the Yoda thing. We were rehearsing, because it was live, we had to rehearse with Steven. And he knows Frank Oz. And so we started to do this bit and he's like, so Yoda, how are you? Mm, yes, good I am. He was like, Frank, Frank, is that you? <laughs> I was like, mm, yes, Frank, I was like, yes, <laughs> yes. And of course I wasn't. But I thought I'd pull his leg for a little while because I had him fooled. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Uh, before I make the announcement uh, to wrap, to finish up, is there anything that you would like to say? No, thanks for having me here. Thanks for taking the time to listen to me yak endlessly. You know, i barely scratched the surface. We haven't talked about the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movies at all. Is there, is there anything you would, do you have a story from that that you'd like to share? Oh no, because it'll take another hour. You know, those were great, those were great fun things to, to work on. The first one, the first, uh, which was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, the first one that I worked on was my first time 
doing animatronics and it was it was trial by fire. Uh, I had never done that kind of thing before where I was responsible for all these remote control servos inside of a head and all that sort of stuff. It was great fun. And the, the second one, uh, which was Turtles 3 that I did, and I graduated from bad guy snapping turtle Toka to one of the principal turtles. I puppeteered Donatello for that one. That was great fun. It wasn't a Henson project, but the crew who worked on it was a lot of ex-Henson people and stuff like that. And I had a blast working with the guy in the turtle suit. It's it's like having a dance partner. He's in the suit dancing around on camera and you're doing the dialogue. So you have to be very in sync with each other. And Jim Raposa, who was in Donatello's suit, was actually a dancer by training. So he understood the collaborative nature of working with somebody else. Because of course, as dancers, you're always dancing together and you're, you're actual like safety is involved with your collaboration because if you're doing spins and turns and stuff like that, if somebody isn't paying attention, somebody's gonna get hurt. And so it was really great. I had a great relationship with Jim and we did a lot of good work. I was very proud of my work on, uh, on Turtles 3. Nice. And now the big announcement. So as if you follow the Nostalgia Talk Facebook page, link in the description, then you probably know that I do, from time to time, I do live trivia nights. I know it's been a little while since the last one, but they're coming back. Next Saturday, July the 3rd, I will be doing Marvel trivia. So if any of you guys are big fans of the old Marvel comics, uh, you know, Spider-Man, Captain America, X-Men, Iron Man, you never know what's going to come up. So be there on Saturday, July 3rd at 7 p.m. Atlantic time, same time as all the other ones, 7 p.m. Atlantic time, uh, 6 o'clock Eastern time, 3 p.m. Pacific time. And Rick, I see that you're a superhero fan as well with your Batman shirt. I know that that's not Marvel, but- Yeah, I'm a DC kind of guy. I, I, I really like the 1966 Batman, the Adam West TV show. That's, uh, that's where my heart lies. I have actually, I have a whole bunch of prop, movie prop and TV show prop replicas that I do. I do Star Trek and Star Wars and Batman, 66 Batman props. And I've got all that stuff. I've got all kinds of stuff. I love that show. Nice. Well, Rick, thank you very much for uh, coming to Nostalgia Talk. My pleasure. Thanks for having me here. And uh, to the listeners, I will see you for Trivia Night. Peace. Bye-bye.